Everybody, welcome to another CISI session for the Level 2 Fundamentals of Financial Services Qualification. Today's session is number 16 um, and we will be discussing derivatives. So this is a new chapter, chapter 6 of the qualification. And we're going to be focusing this session on an introduction and uses of derivatives. And as usual, the usual format, I do have two special guests with me um, for those that are working in the profession. So I'd like to say hello and introduce to Elliot Coleman, who's a business development um, individual at AQR Capital, and also Sachin Batia, who is a head of UK consultant and core institutional clients at Invesco. Welcome, gents. Nice to nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, hello. Martin. Thanks for having us. No, no problem at all. And um, what we're going to start off with is just to ask Elliot and Sachin to um, tell us a bit about um, what they do, who they work for, and how they got to to where they are. So, Elliot, if we if we can start with you, please, if you could give us a bit about your career so far and what you do in your current role. Yeah, sure, no problem. So, hi everyone. My name is Elliot Coleman, and I'm part of the business development team at AQR Capital Management. So, so who is AQR? Well, AQR stands for Applied Quantitative Research. And we are a global asset manager that was founded in 1998 and were headquartered in Greenwich, Connecticut in the US. So I mentioned that the Q in AQR stands for quantitative, and that simply means that we use computer programs to help us manage our investments. Our portfolio managers use their research to program the computers to buy and sell the assets that we like. So why use computers, you may ask? Well, it allows us to efficiently process a large amount of data across multiple assets, such as equity, fixed income, currencies, commodities, etc. Some of these asset classes that you'll be learning about on, on the program. And it also just allows us to do this much more efficiently um, than we could do manually or with or even with an army of people. It also allows us to set up a repeatable and transparent investment process and have a very wide investment universe to choose from. So we can consistently invest in many more things than we could do if we were not using the computers. So what do I do in my role? <clears throat> as, as I mentioned, I'm part of the business development team where our role is broadly to build relationships with investors and investment professionals in order to provide them with solutions to help meet their investment objectives. And I guess more specifically, um, I'm directly responsible for the UK and Ireland investment consultant relationships that we have at AQR. Now, you may have already heard from some investment consultants who are participating on this program, but, but just as a quick reminder, investment consultants are financial experts who provide advice to clients on their investments. So how did I get here and what is my background? Well, I grew up in Edmonton, North London, and I went to a local school in the area. I took business studies, maths and physics A-levels, and I also did an art AS level. But I'm not sure if, if AS, AS level still exist. I know that it has changed from, from, from when I was younger. Um, and I guess from there, I went to university. I studied business studies with accounting. I've always had an interest in, in finance and the stock market, investing and how you know, to make money and how um, people with more money than, than I do <laughs> make even more money for themselves. So I decided to take one year out of university as part of my as part of my program to do an industrial placement at uh, Morgan Stanley, which is a large investment bank. Um, <clears throat> so once I'm completing my industrial placement, Morgan Stanley kindly offered me a role back on the graduate scheme once I graduated. And so in 2008, I joined the grad scheme at Morgan Stanley. Uh, since Morgan Stanley, I've had many different uh, roles in, uh, in a few other asset managers and banks. But I guess later in my career, I decided to get further education. And so I completed a master's in finance at London Business School. AQR are a very academic organization and they have ties with many top tier universities and business schools. And it's, and it's through London Business School where I found my, my current role at AQR. And that brings me to up to date to, to where I am today. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Elliot. That's really, that's really great to hear, um, hear hear where you've come from and how you've got there and everything else. So uh, thank you very much indeed. And Sachin, could we, could we come to you? Can you tell us a bit about sure. yourself, um, who you work for and, and, and what you do and how you got there, please? Sure. So I, I work at Invesco. We're a large global asset manager. At last count, I, we managed about $1.4 trillion of dollars under management globally. So uh, across 
all asset classes and all investor types. So what we mean by that is sort of, you know, global offices, we we operate in all markets across equities, fixed income, real estate uh, and so on. And servicing clients from pension funds to sovereign wealth funds to sort of um, retail or, you know, individual investors um, across the globe. And in terms of my role, besides having an extra long job title, which even I fully forget sometimes, but uh, it basically what it means is I face off to investment consultants in the UK and institutional clients. So as Elliot touched on, investment consultants are financial advisors or experts, but they specifically advise institutions. So rather than individuals, they're advising pension funds, et cetera, and, and sort of institutional investors, as we call them. So I manage those relationships in the UK. And then the team that I head up um, looks after our institutional book or a set of clients. So that is, again, mostly pension funds, some charities, endowments. Um, and the you know the logic there is that we're, we're dealing with their advisors, so we're dealing with their clients as well at the same time. And they're invested across a number of asset classes. And we're, the, it's, it's the interesting part of my role means that you're not only talking to different types of investors and different consultants, but you've got to sort of know a little bit about every asset class and a bit about all of the strategies. So I'm not going to profess to be an expert in everything, but I could probably, you know, keep a conversation going for two to three minutes on any of the investment strategies before you see the sweat dripping down my, my forehead and I have to get a specialist involved right so very interesting keeps keeps you um sort of you know, keeps you your brain moving along in terms of knowing about the investment strategies my background uh similar to Elliot grew up in in London in, in North West London in Harrow and went to university did economics there and then went on to do the CFA, so that's the uh, the, uh, the CFA certification, kind of straight out outside of uni, uh, as part of a graduate scheme at PwC. And on the back of that, you know, the CFA is very focused, similar to the CISI at sort of you know the investment industry. So moved into a role as an investment consultant, um, which is gives me gave me a good grounding for my current role. And then I've worked in various asset managers, facing off to clients either in a business development role or in a relationship role. So. Um, it's kind of been a bit of a random walk, but I've ended up sort of using all of that experience to make sure that I can talk to our investors about our strategies, know a little bit about what I'm talking about, and, and it keeps me very interested and on my toes. So that's kind of where I am and, and how I've got to where I am. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Ashley. Really, uh, really appreciate that as well. So thank you. Th thank you both guys. So we've got a nice uh, introduction into what both of our guests um, do and how they got to where they are. So in terms of what this session will cover off, we are really going to look at uh, what derivatives are, their uses and, and their application. And we're also going to focus a little bit on one type of derivative, which is a, a forward. Um, and this will link quite nicely into futures and options that we'll look at in the in the next session, session number 17. So to start off with, um, I'm just going to ask um, Elliot a, a, a question, which is uh, to give a, a, an explanation of what derivatives are. Would you like to um, tell us a bit about what, what they are? Yeah, sure, certainly. So to put it simply, if you can, <laughs> uh, a derivative is a financial instrument which derives or gets its value from an underlying asset. And uh, by underlying asset, we're generally talking about equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. So some of these asset classes you've probably come across on the course already or you will do shortly. Um, but that list isn't exhaustive. Um, you can also have derivatives on things such as interest rates and, and even weather. I guess um, the most common types of derivatives are futures, options, forwards and swaps. <clears throat> I think you're going to be learning learning about forwards towards the end of this session and in more detail in a, in a future session. Um, they they have different properties, I guess, all of the different types of derivatives. Um, and by properties, you can also think of these as rules in terms of how they are used. And they're generally governed by a contract that, that will state these properties. And it's this contract that creates a link between the derivative and the underlying asset. Brilliant. Thanks very much, uh, Elliot. That's uh, really nicely detailed. Gives us a nice introduction into what they are. So I suppose the question comes up around how how did derivatives come about? And and actually, they've been around for um, more time than we probably think, to be honest. And they've been around uh, a good couple of hundred years, derivatives. And they go back to kind of simple trades or transactions that were carried out between two parties. So the kind of first types of derivatives originated between um, individuals that were trading, things like farmers and merchants. 
So you may have a, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, you may have had a farmer who obviously had harvested crops, um, may have cattle to sell, livestock, that kind of thing, dairy produce. Um, and you would, um, we obviously back then we wouldn't have had supermarkets that these people may have sold directly to. We may have had individuals like merchants that would travel around, buy up these products from um, individuals that were producing them from the raw materials. And then they would potentially then sell those on to somebody else. OK, so the way they kind of came about was through these transactions and de dealings between these individuals. So if we kind of take an example of maybe wheat being traded between farmers and merchants, what would have happened maybe a couple of hundred years ago is that the farmer before the, the wheat may have been harvested may have wanted to get a buyer for this wheat and the merchant may have wanted to source some wheat so he had some, something to sell to uh, to his customers as he as he traveled traveled around so what they would do is they would then start to negotiate and start to talk about um, the terms of an agreement between them that would form this kind of contract if you like so in this case you have as Elliot was saying the underlying asset so in this this situation it would be something like wheat so the merchant would be the buyer of the asset, they would be the buyer of the wheat, and the farmer would be the seller of the asset, the seller of the wheat itself. So in terms of the contract that they would agree, in the terms of that contract, there are certain things that obviously would have to be discussed and negotiated and settled on between them for that purpose. So obviously the price of the underlying asset, so in this case the wheat, would have to be negotiated and agreed upon by the two parties. The quantity of the asset in terms of the wheat, how much would actually be traded at the date and location on which that was determined, that was also important. Also, not many people may kind of think about this, but the quality of the assets, especially with things like wheat, it might be um, things like moisture content and things like that, that would need to be agreed between the two parties before that transaction took place. Also, the date of delivery. So what would generally happen with these sorts of contracts is that, as we said, the uh, terms of the agreement would be agreed at one point in time for a future delivery date um, down down the road. That might be three months, five months, a year, whenever that 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 term or agreement might be might be determined. So the date of delivery of the asset, so the wheat, the quantity of the wheat and the exchange of the money to purchase the wheat would be agreed between them, as would the location of that delivery. So as I said, the, these form the terms of the agreement and that would that was all agreed now for something that would happen at a future date between the two individuals. So that's how derivatives kind of came about and using an example of maybe a couple of hundred years ago, what these parties in this, this contract would have agreed between them and the terms that they would negotiate. So this we now know what a derivative is and we know now we we now know how they came about so i'm going to hand over to sashi now he's going to talk about what derivatives are actually used for today yep thank you uh we all right to just move to the, maybe the first slide and i can talk around that um so i guess we we've touched on this already but really derivatives being being based on the price of an underlying asset is there to get rid of uncertainty right that's why uh, if we look at the the discussion matt has just covered in terms of what they're being used for it's to protect against changes in the value of the underlying asset that they're linked to so we've talked we've, we've got on this example here if we carry on with the wheat example there are various factors that can change the the end price of the wheat that's being produced right there could be a drought poor harvest bad weather changes in demand changes in production quality uh, cost so really what they were used for is um, what's known as hedging or to protect uh, the, both the buyer and seller in terms of providing certainty of the price uh, of the sale and purchase of the underlying asset. So if we kind of fast forward to why they're used now, there is a similar use. It's just we're not, I mean, wheat is still actually um, an underlying derivative contract that's used, but there's similar use across across markets and industries. So if we think about airlines, or if we think about anything that involves raw materials or some um, sort of continuous uh, input, whether that is, you know, oil or some sort of uh, other material, then it's the same principle. 
trying to protect against future prices and protect against um, both for the buyer and seller. So what? why would you want to do that? If you're the producer, you actually, you know, it's in your interest because you have certainty of the revenues that you're achieving of the price you're going to sell your, your product or your, your raw material. So that's, let's say, oil in this instance. And on the flip side, if you're the, the user of that end product, so if you're an airline and you have uh, to utilize jet fuel, the last thing you want is fluctuations in those prices that's changing sort of your your costs of travel, right? So, and there's a number of factors that we've talked about there that can affect that. So on the uh, changes in sort of future prices, you know, things like political unrest, things like we've seen in recent times with, with corona or changes in, in sort of political dynamics or, you know, rules around travel, demand changes because of things that are happening in the world, decisions by the oil producers. There's lots of different uh, moving parts and uh, external mo factors that are out of the control of the airline, right? So they want to, if they can lock in a certain price, they're, they're keen to do that. Similarly, you know, on the flip side, exactly the same for the oil company. So it's in the interest on both sides to agree a, a future exchange date and an agreed price um, and a delivery date. So that that's the sort of one of the key uh, use, uses of derivatives, and that's what's known as hedging. So, you know, and, and you've often heard the term to hedge your bet. So it's similarly to hedge your costs, right? So, so that's one of the uses. Now, what we've also seen develop is um, sort of more the speculative use of of derivatives and Elliot touched on this before that you know the derivatives market has evolved so far that you can even have derivatives on things like weather right so um it, it, uh, and, and there's there's a long list as long as my arm of sort of other things that derivatives are useful but what really you're, you're looking at there is uh, entities like hedge funds or other investment managers using derivatives to as it says they make money on asset price movement so they don't actually have any use or interest in the underlying asset so even if they're in uh, investing in uh, oil derivatives they don't actually want to take the de delivery of the gold at the pre-agreed exchange date uh, but they have a view on the uh, sorry on oil a view on the price of oil right whether it's going to go up and down and they'll then act according to that so that's where you have sort of another another set of uh, participants in the market who are making money on asset price movements they're speculating from my perspective and uh, looking at the sort of the role I'm in and the the, the firm I'm in hedging and speculating are used across uh, in in both senses and for derivatives hedging I would say is used a lot for clients for example where they're investing in um, overseas investments that are that are denominated in a different currency so if you're in the UK and you're investing in let's say US dollar investments you may want to not have the risk of that fluctuation of movement between your uh, pound or sterling and US dollar, right? So you can lock in a rate that you're going to exchange your your exchange rate, and that's the, the sort of hedging where it's used most importantly for a lot of my clients. Speculating again, we will have funds or investment managers who are running strategies where they are taking views on prices and price movements, and they will use derivatives to then um, to then express those views, and that's where they're expressing them through speculating. So. Derivatives have evolved. They're used for different things. I think the principle, you know, where they originated from still exists in terms of hedging, but we've seen this sort of growth and evolution of, of speculating and derivatives are an efficient way of actually, um, if you have a, a certain view or opinion of a price movement, expressing those rather than investing, going out and buying the oil, for example, or the gold or wherever it may be, right? So it's an efficient way of doing that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sashin. That's a great explanation of of hedging and speculating um, in terms of the uses of, of derivatives. Thank you very much. It's um, great. So we now know the uses of them, what they are. The last thing that we need to cover off is, is the first type of derivative that um, we need to, to look at. And, and Elliot actually mentioned earlier, there were kind of some of the main ones, forwards, futures, options, swaps. And, and we don't, for, for this qualification, we don't need to worry about swaps, And we'll but we'll look at futures and uh, options next uh, in the next session. So in terms of what a forward contract is, we've already actually seen it. So when we were referring to the old fashioned, how derivatives came about in terms of the, the interaction and the contract put together by the farmer and the merchant, this was an example of a forward contract. So if you recall, it was the, the farmer selling uh, the asset, which was the wheat and the merchant buying the asset uh, which obviously, as we said, is the wheat. Now, because as you recall, when we were talking about um, how derivatives came about, I mentioned about the terms of the contracts and about the 
the items that needed to be negotiated between these two parties. And that, that was the quantity, quality, price, delivery date and location of the asset. OK, so all of those terms would have been in those original derivative contracts negotiated and agreed directly between the two parties or counterparties, as we might know them for a derivative, that everything was agreed between them. OK, now this is what is referred to as an OTC or over the counter trade. OK, so when the terms are agreed between two parties directly and there's free reign over those those negotiations, um, that's what's known as a, a, an OTC or a traded over the counter uh, transaction or trade. So the original types of derivatives like these that go back a couple of hundred years, they were forward contracts. There was no exchange that was sat as, a, as an intermediary or a middleman between these two parties. These were everything was negotiated between them. Um, and that was an OTC contract. And that is what a forward is. So it's when the asset would be delivered at a future date. Everything was agreed prior to that, a number of months in advance, potentially. And all of those terms between those two parties would have been negotiated directly between those two parties there. So the merchant and the farmer would have determined all of that themselves. There was no exchange sat between them that then maybe dictated or set terms of that, that contract or that trade. So an over-the-counter derivative contract like this uh, would have been referred to or would be seen as a forward. So that just, just gives a description of what a forward is. As we said, we've already kind of looked at that at the start of this session, um, and that kind of just explains to you um, what the term over-the-counter also means in relation to what a forward contract actually is. OK. Gents, before we, um, that, that brings us to an end, is there, is there anything that either of you would like to add to any of that? Have we covered off everything that, that you think we, we need to there? Nothing else to talk about? Yeah, I, I think that's good, Matthew. But I guess um, I was just thinking while you were speaking of um, another example of a forward that may help uh, bring it to life for the students. So maybe if, if you go back just one slide, if you if you may. Um, oh, cool. to what you were just discussing and I mean we may have some students who have experience in farming um, or, or, or not so maybe the, the wheat example is, is quite relevant but, but let's just assume you know in a future state where we're all allowed to go on holiday again you know you may be planning a trip abroad and um, obviously if you're going to another country that uses a, a different currency um, you're going to have to exchange your currency in order to spend your money abroad so <laughs> An example of this could be that in a year's time, you're planning a trip to say the United States. So you may need some US dollars. Um, but from today, the exchange rate that you get for your pounds can differ wildly, you know, at the time that you come to actually go on holiday. So the motivation for forward is to try and agree today a price for the exchange rate so you, you you can you can have um, you can mitigate your risk of the exchange rate moving against you so that you actually get less dollars in the future when you actually need them to go on holiday. You can agree um, an over the counter um, type contract, a forward contract to exchange um, pounds for dollars at an agreed rate today for in the future. So that kind of mitigates your risk in terms of not having enough US dollars to spend on your trip because you've entered into a, an agreement today that um, guarantees, as long as the the, the seller, the, the other person to the transaction doesn't default, um, it kind of guarantees that you'll have a certain amount of dollars to spend. So obviously the, these types of agreements aren't necessarily, you know, ag agreed person to person who are going on holiday, but, you know, big companies, you know, use the same concept to mitigate risk of um, transactions that they have to do in different currencies in the future. This type of practice happens all the time. And um, yeah, so currency forwards are an example of, of forward contracts that are used actively today. And I guess the example of you going on holiday to exchange a currency is just to, you know, put the mindset, give you the mindset or the motivation as to why someone would want to, would want to do that. Yeah, really good example, Elliot. Thank you so much for that. That just, yeah, like you say, just brings it brings it a bit more to life in the in the modern world um, in terms of how these 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 things actually 
happen now and, and what they're used for. So absolutely, thank you so much. And Sachin, was there anything else that you, you wanted I would, to... I would ju- just to, to add on to what Elliot said, if you you know the, the, if you know take that logic that, that he's quite, uh, you know, covered very well there in terms of you want to remove that uncertainty, right? That when you're going on holiday and the, 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 the change, and that's exactly, if you just take that, that same concept forward and think that's how sort of anyone operating in the commercial or business world wants to operate. If there are risks that they're, they're not, actively taking and they're not they're unrewarded risks and they can actually mitigate those and remove those then that's the aim of derivatives and so what you do find is i and i remember learning about derivatives sort of you know getting into uni and stuff on the face of it they seem and they get more complicated and then they seem quite complex and sort of you know compared to just buying the asset but actually in what you find is in in the real world they're actually traded very heavily and actually even more more so than some of the underlying assets just because they're an efficient way of 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 uh, either hedging yourself or or uh, or expressing views on the assets if you imagine how much more complicated it is to keep buying barrels of oil and having to transport them and then sell them back and do things like that right so there there is as on the face of it they may initially a- academically seem quite complicated but there is some lo- logic and rationale for them to exist and and they do improve efficiency Thanks very much, Sachin. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Yeah, really good point uh, off of uh, the back of what Elliot has, has spoken about. But, um, OK, that's that's fantastic. I just want to kind of finish off with um, just to remind you that if you are in the Google Classroom, that there is a, a little multiple choice test to, to do on this to, to test your understanding about what derivatives are and why they are used. And it just um, finally, just to say a massive thank you to uh, Elliot and Sachin for, for joining us for this session. Thank you guys so much for your input into this. Really appreciate it. And thanks also very much for telling us a, a bit about what you do and how you got there as well. It's really, really valuable. No thanks, problem. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. We'll see, we'll see you for the next session. Take care. Cheers.